an anarchist historically generally used majority vote, uh, not what today is called consensus. They did use what today is called consensus, but which they called unanimity. Unanimity. I can't say the word. Unanimity. Yeah. Unanimity. Oh, but I can't say it either. It's a difficult <laughs> word, but that's the word they used. Uh, unanimity. Unanimity. Yeah. No, unanimity. <laughs> unanimity. There you go. That word. They yeah. they use that. Hello and welcome to the 159th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Friday the 21st of May 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week I'm delighted to welcome the anarchist YouTuber extraordinaire Zoe Baker aka Anarchopack to the show. In this two-parter, the second part of which is a Patreon only episode, we discuss the many similarities and some of the differences between Marxism and anarchism, and the chances for a possible synthesis. If you like what you hear, and fancy a listen of part two, why not head over to the Patreon and fire me a few commie dollar. For five bucks a month, you get access to the entire back catalogue of Patreon episodes, access to the Emancipation Discord server, and you can join the Patreons only weekly reading group for the brilliant Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. Okay, enough of the hard sell. Let's join the interview. Hi Zoe, so how the hell did you get into anarchism? So when I was a teenager, my philosophy teacher gave me a book on anarchism because I'd been saying some kind of radical things in class. And I read it and was like, wow, this is what I believe. And then I then kind of googled Kropotkin and then read all the Kropotkin I could find and wouldn't stop talking about Kropotkin with my friends who weren't, they were not interested. (laughs) And yeah, and then I just started, the more I read, the more I was convinced of it. And then I became kind of obsessed with the history of it and how it developed and what its ideas were. And yeah, that's, I I became an anarchist by kind of accidentally being exposed to it. And then kind of, yeah, the more I read, the more I thought it was good. Yeah, I kind of came to I kind of came to Marx. I I don't know if I'd say I came to Marx through like Chomsky, but probably close enough. I bought a bunch of books at the same time and just started reading. And I was probably more interested in the political economy kind of stuff. So I, you know, that I think you're more likely to be primed to go down the Marx route. But you on your channel, like you seem to really you're like an anarchist who really reads a lot of Marx. Are there many of are there many anarchists like you? Um, so historically, there were anarchists who were ex-Marxists. And when they became anarchists, they were still really into Marx's economics and like views on history. There were some anarchists. So like Carlo Caffaro was an anarchist who wrote a kind of summary slash intro to Marx's Capital which Marx himself liked, and he generally really disliked attempts to kind of summarize his work because they were generally like inaccurate. And it became one of the standard introductions to Marx's capital in the Italian socialist movement for both anarchists and, and uh, Marxists and other kinds of socialists. So it definitely like has been a thing, although there's also a whole bunch of anarchists who say even if they read Marx, don't uh, like him. So like Kropotkin every now and then makes a kind of disparaging remark towards capital and Marx's political economy, but never really goes into a huge amount of detail uh, as to why. And so I think even even among anarchists who read Marx, they don't necessarily like him, although there were anarchists historically who did like him. Part of the reason why is that they're often kind of interpreting Marx through the version of Marx that's presented to them at the time by Marxist parties, which is often actually like not what Marx thought. It's kind of like what pop science is to actual science, but for Marxism. It's probably worse. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, in many respects, I guess. Well, now it's like uh, my introduction to Marx was the kind of academic secondary literature, which is, you know, relying on sources that just weren't available at the time. And then that showed a kind of Marx that historic anarchists didn't know existed because, you know, they did not have access to like the economic and philosophic uh, manuscripts. Bakunin had absolutely no knowledge of the critique of the Goffre program, for example, you know, things like that. 
part of why I think I like Marx way more than historic anarchists is because I have access to things that they didn't, which made me able to see the commonalities between Marx and anarchism that they weren't in a position to see. And so, yeah, I, I would kind of call myself a libertarian communist because I want a synthesis of the best of anarchism and Marx. Although when it comes to strategy, which I think is really the like defining characteristic of anarchism, I very much am an anarchist and you know, disagree about Marx on that. Yeah, like it, it seems to be to be one of the kind of not the not the Marxism of Marxists, but like the Marxism of Marx seems to be primarily the major differences between like kind of what I think in my head, not as an anarchist or anarchist like expert or anything, but as like standard anarchism, it seems to be really a strategic difference on how you could get to a anarchist slash communist future. For you, what are the main kind of, what are the main kind of schisms when it comes to strategic thought? So with respect to Marx, the main disagreement is about parliamentary politics. So Marx was committed to the view that communists should try to participate in elections and win seats in parliament in order to progress towards the achievement uh, of communism. And this is through things like, he, he thinks when you are able to ensure certain kinds of basic political rights through the state, like freedom of press, freedom of speech, that will create a situation in which you can then effectively organize a mass working class social movement. Or he thinks you can use participating in parliament as a way to spread socialist ideas to a wider audience. I, I don't think when he was older, he was committed to the view that you could solely through parliamentary politics achieve socialism. There is one source where he says in Europe, you know, we're going to achieve things through insurrection, but in England, we could do it uh, through parliament. But I, I don't, I'm kind of not sure of the extent to which he himself believe that because when he's writing there's a when he's giving the speech there's a lot of kind of moral panic about the paris commune and about the international and there's a lot of state repression towards the international in various countries where it's being made illegal and so in that context it kind of makes sense that you try to be uh, saying yeah. certain things to to avoid a huge uh, backlash that gets in the way of other things you're trying to achieve because that their letters where Engels is which obviously isn't marx so they, you know they are different people <laughs> uh, but they agreed on a lot um but there are letters where Engels says, like, yeah, no, we don't think we can just take over the state through parliamentary politics and then achieve communism. We think there'll come a point where capitalists will essentially try to overthrow us, <laughs> even if we're in parliament and we're actually pushing towards a kind of revolutionary situation. And then we'll then, you know, have to go beyond the parliamentary struggle to achieve our goals rather than thinking you can only do it through that. But anarchists reject that that view. They They don't think social movements should engage in parliamentary politics you know and this is both to spread ideas but also to achieve short-term reforms to protect basic political rights and the reason why anarchists were against this is they thought that what will happen is social movements that participate in parliamentary politics will be transformed through that and they and, and the leaders of the party who become politicians will become concerned with expanding their power within the state rather than overthrowing it they'll become concerned with maintaining existing economic and social relations rather than uh, wanting to overthrow them and this will also have a really negative effect on social movements because for example uh, in the international there was a situation where there were workers who were wanting to go on strike and there was a politician who was actively trying to prevent that from happening because he thought it would decrease his ability to get elected and this is also a thing that's happened you know, in the history of socialist parties where there's been conflict between workers wanting to engage in struggle and politicians who are like, you know, you're going to scare away people who would vote for us. We need to moderate our program. You know, now's not the time to do this because the election's coming up. And so things get kind of sacrificed for the election. And then what you end up achieving is even if you like they, they didn't think that you would even be able to achieve significant reforms through parliament, even if you did manage to get elected on a really like kind of watered down, like non-revolutionary program. And that when they do do things, it's because there are social movements outside of parliament that are forcing politicians in general to do that. 
And if that's the case, why not mainly just focus on the movements outside of parliament, given that they thought it was sufficient to achieve the kinds of changes that made society better or built towards a revolution? There are kind of other more obscure differences to do with how to organize kind of organizations. That's a, that's a fun phrase. Uh, how to structure organizations. Um, so Marx was generally in favor of a more centralized organization than the anarchists. And so even if you think that with Marx on the Paris Commune, when he says, you know, we need to essentially abolish the existing state in favor of a worker state, which is based on, you know, workers themselves uh, running things. There's even if you think that's very similar to what anarchists advocate, but in different language, there are there is still a difference about centralization versus federalism, which is it's not like a it's not a huge, huge difference, but it is, as I think, a significant one. But yeah, I think those are the two main ones, centralization versus federalism and supporting parliamentary politics versus being against it. But on other things, there's loads of agreement. So both Marx and the anarchists were committed to the view that workers, uh, when they engage in action, they transform themselves and the world simultaneously. And Marx calls this revolutionary practice in the thesis on Feuerbach. And anarchists advocate the exact same idea, which is that when workers, for example, go on strike, they're not just going on strike, they're also changing themselves. So they're becoming radicalized or they're learning about socialism or they're changing their attitude to their boss. And that that's how you generate social change is by people ch uh, literally changing themselves through their actions and the kinds of social movements they participate in. But they kind of reach different conclusions about how what to do concretely based on that. So... I definitely think the historical evidence for actually existing Marxist parties is one that has led them to be co-opted into the bourgeois political regime. I think that's kind of historically, you can't deny it. But I would also say, though, that like, say if we take the most, I think Marxists look back at the most successful kind of inverted commas revolutionary Marxist party as the German SPD. Like I just have, uh, I've recently reread the Critique of the Gothic Program. There's a, a letter in the start of it, in my version anyway, where he writes to this guy, W. Brack. I don't know if you know this one, but he says in one line here, he goes, one knows that the mere fact of unification. So he's talking here about the SPD was kind of brought together as a, as a coalition of a kind of a Marxist party. I think the Eisenachers they were called and the Lasallians which kind of ended up being the kind of social democrat of uh, Bernstein, that kind of a wing of the, of the party. He says, one knows that the mere fact of unification is satisfying to the workers, but it's a mistake to believe that this momentary success is not bought too dearly. Like, I would kind of say that, uh, from my point of view, I kind of look at the experience of, say, that SPD and what happened in World War I and the core contradiction that was at the base kind of starting of the party, the revolutionary Marxist party and this kind of state socialist kind of wing, the Salians, that when World War I came along, that contradiction got blown apart and it, that party got split up again into its component parts and it split up into like council communists and uh, the communist party as opposed to the social democrats. And I, I kind of feel like that, so much of the evidence for the complete failure of a party approach so far is is kind of bound up in kind of historical processes that i i feel personally that like history would have to run a few more times before i would say that the party form itself is like a dead end that the tendencies that you correctly point out that they can't be somehow uh, managed by party structure and organizational form well, I'm, I'm not aware of an instance in which a kind of, so I think, so the, the term party has lots of different meanings. And so historically, it generally just means like a social movement or a group of people who adhere to the same ideas. So anarchists historically often talk about the anarchist party and advocate the anarchist party, by which they mean anarchism as a social movement, or more narrowly, organizations composed exclusively of anarchists which participate in social movements in order to push them in a radical direction. And that's distinct from a kind of centralized hierarchical organization 
which exists with a membership in order to participate in parliamentary politics. And so there might be things that are kind of broadly under the rubric of like a the party form that are much more compatible with anarchism. So for example, the communist parties formed by council communists were explicitly opposed to parliamentarianism, as far as I recall. And that is, you know, much closer to the kind of specific anarchist organizations anarchists advocated. And so it's it's kind of it's you have to be really specific about what you actually mean when talking about the party or the party form, given like how many things that can include, some of which are really not at all anything like anarchism and fundamentally different, and some things which are kind of more similar, like the the, the Council Communist Party. Yeah, like I feel like that there is a synthesis, like, as in like the history of bourgeois parties essentially has been the history of centralization and, you know, top-down control. Overwhelmingly, that's how they, they have functioned. And including that, I would, I would include in that, like, you know, the, the Marxist parties that we look back at and say, oh, they, they had a good, a good run of it for a while. Like, uh, I think, like, uh, any party would have to be controlled from the base uh, and have policy controlled by the base and have, like, I don't know, like, the representatives would literally only have a propaganda function and juxtapose themselves against the state in a revolutionary manner. Like I can imagine that such a party in a, in a bourgeois parliamentary system, it's not about winning power and getting state control, but it's like a, it's really a propaganda function for a revolutionary social movement. I think my, my issue with that kind of an idea is that in reality, once you start engaging in parliamentary politics, you're going to attract people to the party who even if you initially set up being like, this is only going to be for like propaganda purposes and nothing else, you end up attracting people to the party that they want it to be about more than that and because you're participating in, in, in elections. Or it will be the case that even if people are initially like that, once they've won a seat, they're like, well, I might as well try and use this for certain respects. And then you can have the kind of same process happening. It's one of those things where like on paper, it can sound like a good idea, like, oh, we can reach loads of people and be part of like mainstream debate and change the parameters of public discourse. But I think it carries with it its own dynamics that will occur independently of people's initial intentions. And it will very quickly not just be about propaganda. And there were people in the you know German Social Democratic Party who thought we should only use this for propaganda. But there were loads of other wings in the same party that disagreed with that and had the same kind of negative effects on the wider organization. So I just think it's very difficult to maintain that over time and I that we should instead focus on, you know, generating our own counterculture and our own ways to spread ideas to as many people as possible, independently of our parliamentary politics. Yeah, like from from my point of view, like I kind of feel like you're see like as communists, right, or, or anarchists, whatever we want to call ourselves, you know, I don't I don't mind being called either really. I suppose I don't call myself an anarchist because I, I think that fundamentally, like if you concede the even if it's bourgeois politics, yeah, if you concede this like area of essentially social battle, there's a, a terrain where you are withdrawing from it seems more important to me to strategize a way of maintaining a position on that field. It would be kind of like in a in a military sense or something. It'd be like saying, "Well, you know, we're going to concede the skies, or we're going to concede the the sea to the British Navy, or the skies to the American Air Force, like, and we'll do ground combat or whatever." I feel like you're just putting yourself at a disadvantage. Like I feel that a lot of the actual failings that have come out of say, revolutionary parties in a kind of political, bourgeois, political party sense were kind of baked into the cake because they were seeking, they were combinations of people that were seeking succor from and, and seeking state control and others that were seeking revolutionary social change. And it's to me that fundamental contradiction at the base is definitely the a, a problem, whether the actual form of the bourgeois party form is still a, a problem. Like, I don't know. I just feel I, I feel like I'm not I'm not fully uh, signed up to the idea that politics is like a uh, bourgeois politics has to be completely seeded. Well, so I think that you 
don't have to see it. You just you interact with it in a different way, right? So you can remain outside of the state and parliamentarianism while at the same time critiquing politicians, critiquing the system as a whole, organizing people to engage in direct action to win their own demands rather than expecting a politician to save them. And so you can be still contributing to wider mainstream discourse and changing the dynamics uh, without engaging in that. So if you look at the recent protests in America, they have successfully managed to mainstream discussions of prison abolition uh, and police abolition in a way that is unprecedented. And I think that shows the way in which direct action movements can change public discourse and reach loads of people without trying to use the big kind of platform of elections to do that, especially given that, you know, pretty much every single attempt to do this at the moment by communists, they are, you know, they're reaching really small numbers of people and you have these kind of really small sects putting candidates up for election to try and reach people. Like you can reach more people now with a podcast or with a YouTube channel or just being on Twitter than many of these parties do through their attempts to participate in elections. Because in our current system, you know, it's very much like in the UK, it's like mainly just Labour versus Conservative a little bit of the Green Party or in America, it's, you know, Democrats versus Republicans. And that's just like, that's the reality of the existing terrain that we're on, as opposed to in the 19th century, when that's the beginning of the formation of modern political parties, like many Marxist parties were the first political parties in certain countries in like the modern sense of, of the term. And we're no longer in that situation. And instead, we have these dominant bourgeois parties that are the norm. And the question that I think social movements are being faced with is, you know, do we try to join the Labour Party or the Democrat Party to change it from within? Uh, and I think the answer is no. And I think the focus should be on direct action movements outside of and against the state, while at the same time, you know, trying to change public discourse, reach the mainstream, you know, spread ideas beyond just a, you know, a small group of, of revolutionaries. But I think the way to do that is if you do big direct action campaigns, they get a lot of press coverage and you then try and use that to make people come into contact with ideas they otherwise wouldn't. I think there's a, definitely a, a, a huge amount of idea winning being done by radicals. I, I certainly think that practically, I don't know, I don't know of a single good Marxist party in the world. They're, you know, they're all sex. They need to die. So I'm not going to find any any arguments with me about it that i i feel though that when we look to the say the the really good successes of things like black lives matter movement in the us and other kind of movements that they struggle like certainly that they, they struggle currently that there doesn't seem to be organizational forms that manage to persist you know that we we see these repeated outbreaks of kind of proto revolutionary type behavior We've seen it like with Occupy, there was the globalization movement, and the then there was the Black Lives Matter. So we see these things pick up, usually uh, synced to capitalist, you know, endogenous crises, you know, economic crises. But we see these things bloom like a an algae bloom out in, you know, the sea or something, and they grow rapidly to a huge size, but they're not able to sustain themselves long term. So like like that wasn't a problem with anarchist movements, you know, in the heyday. And it, it wasn't a problem for, say, Marxist movements in their heyday. But like, what is it about the current kind of, I think in America, it's probably, it is the kind of, the, the, the trendy radical thing is, I, I don't know, I don't know. Certainly anarchism is at least as trendy as Marxism or left-wing kind of party thought in America. What is it about today's, anarchist movement that is not able to turn these blooms or keep that keep that fire lit over these longer term to develop it towards something revolutionary so historically when there've been mass anarchist movements it's it's been through trade unions and those trade unions and, and the kind of organizational structures they formed were able to sustain themselves you know over time between different kind of upheavals in kind of i guess what we might call popular insurgency against the ruling classes and there was this kind of combination of formal structures and affinity groups feeding off each other 
So during periods of repression in Spain, one of the ways the anarchist movement was able to survive when the CNT was made illegal was that they had other kinds of organization that could sustain, sustain themselves, such as affinity groups, you know, composed of a, f a few people who were very close to one another, but also kind of cultural centers. And, and these, you know, weren't illegal in the way that the, the union headquarters were. And so they had loads of different kind of w ways to sustain themselves that worked together, where it wasn't like they were only doing formal organization on a large scale and not doing other things. They were doing both formal organization, large scale, and you know, small infinity groups. And that was like a core reason why they were able to survive a huge amount of state repression, uh, which is you know, much greater than what the modern anarchist movement in America has experienced. Uh, like you know, members of the CNT were being assassinated in, in large numbers. There were gun battles on a kind of quite regular basis uh, where people were having to you know, defend themselves. And I think part of it, well, in the modern situation, you have people who will participate in, you know, these protests and say might be in an affinity group, but there's no kind of overarching structure beyond just the kind of interpersonal networks between people. So then people can be really active and then get burnt out and then, you know, fall out. And there isn't that overarching structure to, to so I, I think I agree with you uh, about that, but I'm also kind of not sure how to construct that structure in the modern world. Uh, you know, I can be like, yeah, these historic anarchists were able to construct these huge trade unions, but I don't know, you know, how we're able to, to, to do that in a, in a modern context because, you know, so many kind of things have changed just to do with class consciousness, what communities are like. So uh, what the, a lot of the anarchist movement historically was based in immigrant communities, which were really closely knit or kind of a societies where there were pre-existing communities like in villages on the countryside where, where they're already really closely knit. And so when they've become anarchists, these family units or these kind of interpersonal relations between immigrants in these you know, c communities are the kind of the solid basis that the movement's built on. Well, now we're in a situation where it's like, you know, you have loads of, say, anarchists in London who don't know of each other's existence, who live in different parts of it. People, I think, are a lot more isolated now. Rates of loneliness are much higher than they were historically. So I think part of the struggles that we in the modern left are dealing with also just to do with the changing dynamics of our society compared to historically, where well, I think it's much more fragmented and much more atomized than it was. And so we don't have these like pre-existing social bonds to build off of, as well as these larger like mass organizational forms to kind of try and sustain things over time. So yeah, I agree with you, it's a problem. I'm not sure how to solve it. And I hope people will be able to do that. You know, I do think people should try to build radical unions and anarchist federations. But, you know, there's one thing to say we should do that. And there's another thing to actually do it and do it on a large scale where you're building, say, you know, an, an narco syndicate trade union with like a million members or something like that's the goal. But that, that's not the reality, even though people obviously are really trying hard to organize and to do good work. The, the loneliness stuff is definitely real. Like the, the, the average number of friends people have is kind of plummeted you know, social interactions, people who could trust their neighbours with their car keys or something like that. Apparently, all these societal statistics, particularly in America, are really gone through the floor. But I kind of do think there's like a, a dialectic of loneliness or something as well, though. I think like the the fact that you get to a, a, a society that gets so atomized that the actual atomization is a spark that will lead to a reformulation of, of connections between people. I definitely can see a kind of a systemic, that process is not going to end up with, you know, everybody having only one friend or zero friends. I kind of see, I, in the in that I, I, systemic trend, I see the kind of, there will be a reaction the other way. Uh, so I don't feel as depressed about than some people with that. When it comes to like, what, organizing these whatever like you know as a marxist i think maybe a good party and good trade unions or whatever you know when you read like the history of kind of what's going on i've been doing a little bit of reading on the history of like uh, 1919 in, in germany and stuff like that and like people literally put their lives on the line for like a you know the cnt or a party or something and you know personally you know i was a computer programmer and if i it, like the idea, if I was working in like a, a corporate place of me unionize, trying to unionize my things, I think I would just shit my pants. Like, I don't think people are really, I, I don't know. I don't think, I, I wonder how much of it is to do with absolute poverty being a motivation function. Like you can actually eat as opposed to maybe in the 18, 1900s 
you know, people were actually hungry. Could that literally be a major motivationary difference? So one of the things, so, so some historic anarchists, like so Rudolf Rocker, he would visit slums in London and he would see you know, these people living in extreme poverty. And the conclusion he came to was that people being extremely poor and you know starving doesn't create people who will revolt because they're so busy just trying to survive that they don't have the time or energy to focus on struggle for any length of time. And if they do, they will kind of stop as soon as uh, you know they, they win something minor. Uh, it won't kind of sustain itself. And so we actually thought incre thought winning improvements for living standards, like shorter working hours, would lead to a situation where workers had more time and energy to focus on uh, organizing and being radicalized and, and building towards revolution. And it's the case that, you know, there are loads of places in the world where people are, you know, living in extreme poverty, but where they don't rise up. And there are cases where people are doing okay in comparison to that, but are. And a lot of kind of trade union disputes historically were over issues to do with control over the work process rather than just kind of like we're starving and we want food. So they were often about issues to do with freedom and issues to do with you know, them having control over their work. And that was a huge motivation for them to organize and rebel was because, you know, humans, humans like being in, in control of their lives. And that can be a huge motivation even if you're having your basic needs met, uh, like, you know, food and, and shelter. It's also a thing of the, the UK, for example, historically had huge amounts of poverty, uh, really bad problems with slums, open sewage, people dying of cholera. And yeah, in the UK, there wasn't a really strong history of kind of militancy in the way there were in other parts of the world. And a huge amount of the left was focused on, you know, parliamentary, parliamentary. politics or yeah. very bureaucratic trade unions. And so even though you have these really dire living conditions that didn't generate into, say, the same kind of direct action revolutionary movements you get in Spain or Italy, also in response to, you know, really bad living standards and, and issues in people's lives. So I think there's also kind of, you know, people having different ideas or different culture can also be this like huge factor, even when you have certain other things in common, like, you know, you're being oppressed by capitalists, people can respond in very different ways and in different contexts. So I, yeah, I, I don't think it's like a guarantee. Like something I sometimes think is that like if things being bad would lead to people rise up, America would have already overthrown its government in response to its terrible healthcare system. You know, like so many people suffer due to it, and it's such this is this huge you know problem. But people aren't rising up against it. Let alone you obviously all the other terrible things in American society that people aren't rising up against. And what's even amazing is also the way in which people can support the terrible things that are ruining their lives so you can have workers who their lives are being destroyed by the american healthcare system but they've been so propagandized that they think yeah this is really good it's, you know so much better than socialized medicine as they're you know in debt or like massively suffering so you also i don't think we should underestimate how effective indoctrination is even when people's lives are objectively terrible and they should be you know organizing against it and it's in their interest to do so it's obviously more complicated than just like being hungry, isn't it? Personally, I think these things, they go in long waves. And I, I feel like that all our, even our radical politics is still washing out the experiences of the last hundred years. I don't know when we're going to, it's going to wash its way out enough that something new can, can form that, you know, maybe it's just one of those kind of long waves of history working its way. Getting towards then, can we talk a little bit about the union as a form in anarchism? I don't, I don't particularly know from like your channel which kind of type of anarchist you specifically consider yourself, or do you know if you like titles or not? But typically, for anarchists, it's kind of like the union is the goddamn thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about why the union? So there are a huge amount of different opinions on trade unions in the anarchist movement. There were some anarchists who were called anti-organizationists who were extremely against trade unions. And they were in favor of essentially kind of armed insurgency against the ruling classes in small decentralized networks coordinated through newspapers. And they thought that trade unions will just reproduce the capitalist system, that they will over time become reformist, they will inevitably become bureaucratic. 
the bureaucrats will develop interests which are distinct from the workers. They thought that they were committed to the iron law of wages, which means, which was the idea that any increase in the uh, amount that people earn will be lost through increases in the cost of living. And so they, they were convinced of this and therefore thought, well, what's the point in us, you know, focusing on trying to win these increased wages if long term it won't actually improve people's lives? And if reforms are kind of thrown down by the ruling classes to try and kind of stop movements from becoming revolutionary, why don't we just focus on being revolutionary and any reforms we get in the process can be good, but that shouldn't be like our main focus. Um, so these are people like Luigi Gallini uh, and Carlo Caffero who hold, who hold that view as some of the prominent names. But they, as far as I can tell, were like a minority position. They were a very loud minority, but it seems to be the case that the majority of anarchists were in favor of trade unions as a, as a vehicle of struggle. Just to clarify, the anti-organizationists, a lot of them did think we should they should participate in trade unions, but literally just to persuade workers that they should instead be engaging in like armed insurgency against the ruling classes. So they thought it was a way to make contact with people rather than as a way to like organize for immediate improvements. But there were the majority of anarchists appear to have been in favor of using the trade union to win immediate improvements. But they 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 shared the critique of bureaucratic and and centralized reformist trade unions. So they wanted revolutionary trade unions. There was kind of two main components to them. So the first one is that they thought they had to prefigure the future society. So they thought the trade unions had to be structured in a way which was which used the same kind of decision making procedures and organizational kind of structure as what will exist in the future anarchist society. And so therefore workers who don't think of themselves as anarchists will join the trade union because they want a better life. They they don't like their boss. But then through the process of participating in the trade union, they'll develop into the kind of person who can reproduce the anarchist social relations and thereby become the kind of person who can then you know, actually create and reproduce a free society. And they thought that the, the trade union structure could be converted during the revolution into what managed the economy. So they thought workers need to get good at making decisions and self-managing their lives in the present. So when there's a revolution, they already know how to do a lot of the things that they will be doing when organizing the entire economy and society, because they've already had lots of experience doing that within the trade union. And they thought that the, if, for example, one part of the trade union is the Federation of Metal Workers, or during the revolution, that federation can expropriate the businesses where they work. And then what was a trade union can then just be converted into a federation of workers' councils. So therefore, when you're forming the trade union, they thought you were literally building the new world uh, in the shell of the old. And the second component was that the trade unions have to be independent of political parties. Some thought they should be explicitly opposed to political parties. So, so revolutionary syndicalists uh, like Puget think that the trade union should just be independent and therefore you'll attract people of all different kinds of persuasion and they'll be united based on their class interests rather than the basis of ideas and then will be you know, transformed through the process of participating in, in the trade union, even if they're, say, in a Marxist political party or in a liberal political party. While anarcho-syndicalists thought that they should be explicitly opposed to political parties and parliamentarianism. And that ended up becoming the majority position in the early 20th century. And they thought that these trade unions should uh, engage in direct action as the means to win immediate reforms. And that this was a way to generate a mass movement that was capable of launching an armed insurrection, which would expropriate the ruling classes. So they think they're creating the social force which is in a position to both take over the economy and to a significant extent, you know, be able to effectively self-manage it. And so people won't die of starvation and also create the social force that can launch an, an, an armed insurrection and defend itself effectively. And so that's why they're in favor of using trade unions to do that. But then there's actually lots of disagreements about how to achieve this goal. So the revolutionary syndicalists like Puget thought the trade union was sufficient unto itself is the phrase they use, by which they mean that we only need trade unions, just with trade unions, we can both win immediate reforms and launch and defend a revolution and take over the economy, and we don't need anything else. While other anarchists, uh, such as Bakunin, Kropotkin, Malatesta, they advocated organizational dualism, 
which means you have a mass organization, which is usually a trade union historically, and a specific anarchist organization, which I referred to earlier, which is an organization composed exclusively of uh, anarchist militants. And they thought that in order to ensure that the trade union actually can become an instrument of revolution, you have to have anarchists as an organized militant minority participating it in order to, say, prevent liberals or other kinds of socialists from taking it over and, say, making it become connected to parliamentary struggle. You need them to be ensuring that a bureaucracy doesn't arise in the trade union, which then develops like interests of its own. You need to be spreading ideas among the membership and influencing the non-anarchist workers, which will be you know, most, most of the membership because people join trade unions for all kinds of reasons. And that through that, you're able to then ensure that the trade union can become or remain revolutionary in a you know, actual sense where the membership are actually committed to you know, expropriating the capitalist class and launching a, a revolution uh, rather than just being say that on paper the trade union is but loads of the membership actually aren't so even if on paper the trade union is revolutionary in, in, in reality it's membership that, that, that uh, they aren't uh, revolutionaries and i would agree with organizational dualism personally although i also feel like i don't know how to like apply it you know to them like a, a modern context and what exactly people should do. I more kind of read all these debates and be like, if I was in the 19th century, I would have agreed with these people. But I'm always wary of being like, and therefore everyone should listen to me and we should do this thing. But I do think the basic idea of having a specific anarchist organization participating in mass movements in order to push them in a radical direction is a good idea because historically, when anarchists haven't done that, they've often been unable to maintain influence within mass movements which then get taken over by other social movements or where the anarchists, like they're, they're not able to like effectively um, achieve any of their goals and become kind of isolated in a kind of subculture rather than being really immersed and influencing mass, mass struggle. Well, that's all of us now. We're just subcultures at the moment. You know, we're yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's very, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That is, that is very much the situation at the, at the moment for the left, um, partly I think just due to yeah, how atomized we are as a society. I don't blame datamization. I just think it's a function of history. I think history has won, has run its kind of social democrat, both the Bolshevik revolutionary social democrat and the kind of parliamentarian social democrat uh, strategies. That's the radical left has ran those strategies around across the world and they're still in the process of failing. So your anarchist, your organized anarchist in the uh, union structure. It's it sounds a little bit like a vanguard. I gotta well, say, yeah, they actually called themselves that. So um, lots of anarchists historically called themselves the vanguard, or the militant minority, or the ones with ideas. They had various terms that were that were used. Uh, the conscious minority, but by this they meant that they thought that they had the most kind of advanced revolutionary ideas and strategies, and they should participate in social movements as a militant minority to influence workers through persuasion and leading by example, and that's it. So you can talk to people, you can persuade them, you can do stuff and it can inspire them and influence them. You know, so like if you're at a protest and there are people doing things, other people can then copy them, you know, and then it spreads through the crowd, that kind of activity. But they were absolutely against uh, seizing power and, and creating, you know, like the rule of the specific anarchist organization over everyone else. They were against trying to kind of set themselves up as con conflating themselves with the working classes as a whole, such that say, you know, you have certain Marxist sects where they talk as if the rule of the Marxist party is the same as the rule of the, the working classes. The anarchists were always really explicit that they were against that and were opposed to that kind of what you might call authoritarian vanguardism. They thought we can only be one node within this wider process and we're trying to contribute our wills towards influencing the outcome of this wider social process but you know that's all we really can do we can't use violence to like impose our wills uh, on other workers we can only use in self-defense against the ruling classes uh, or to overthrow the ruling classes and so yeah so a lot of marxists can be kind of like you explain what was the mainstream anarchist strategy done by anarchists around the world that's in like you know, all the major anarchist authors advocate this and they go, wow, that sounds like vanguardism. And it's like, no, this is anarchism. This is like, this is just mainstream anarchism. But you don't know that 
because you've only like you know read like Lenin or something, and then it reminds you of certain bits of it, and you go, oh, this is kind of the same. And it's like, well, actually, it's its own thing. It has its own history. It was originally invented by Bakunin. Was the was the you know, mainstream view, and there were, then, then the main debates in the anarchist movement were to a significant extent like, how do we organize the specific anarchist organization? What kinds of social movements should the specific anarchist organization be participating in? How should we act so as to ensure that we don't accidentally, independently of our intentions, become you know authoritarian vanguardists who impose their will on other workers? You know, those were like the main strategic debates to a huge extent. An awful lot of the problems of kind of radical left politics is by Marxist reading Marxists talking about anarchists and probably vice versa. Yeah, well, uh, I, I'm like, read everyone and then work yeah. out what you think is my, my position because people misrepresent each other all the time, especially in like polemical feuds. <laughs> like I'm, I'm going to get off this call, Zoe, and then I'm just going to misrepresent everything you've said. I'm going to be... <laughs> I'm going to be editing out like, you know, any of your, your negative statements, you know, like the not out of a statement. And I'm going to make it out like everything you said is back to front. That's how I roll. So one thing I have a question for you, like how exactly prefigurative was, was, were organizations like the CNT? Did they end up with bureaucracies? So this is a really complicated question. <laughs> um, so, OK, so the first thing is you have to explain how the CNT was actually organized which is really complicated, <laughs> um, but I'll try, I'll try my best. So, and also how it's organized actually changes over time. So what I'm describing is kind of like early 1930s CNT or late 1920s, but it's kind of different in, in 1910 when it first emerges. But so, so the way it was organized is you have what are called the single unions or they're like the, the local trade union, which unites uh, all the workers in a given industry in that area. And they have a general assembly where they make all their decisions through direct democracy. And anarchists historically generally used majority vote, uh, not what today is called consensus. They did use what today is called consensus, but which they called unanimity. Unanimity. I can't say the word. Unanimity. But I can't say it either. It's a difficult (laughs) word, but that's the word they used. Uh, Unanimity. Unanimity. No, (laughs) unanimity. Unanimity. There you go. That word. They yeah. they use that generally in smaller affinity groups where everyone's close friends and you've got like four to six people. But in the mass organizations like the trade unions, they usually use the majority vote just because you have to get stuff done. And you often have people with different positions that, you know, it's hard to always achieve that, that consensus on. But yeah, so, so they, they made decisions through these general assemblies composed of the whole membership. And then what they would do is that there's a federal structure. So they would elect that there were a bunch of different kinds of delegate. Each uh, local union would uh, elect. So you've got, you know, the, the person who represents them at the regional congresses, which are attended by delegates representing every other local union. And they would be they would be uh, mandated on what to say, although it, they weren't instantly recallable which a lot of anarchist organizations now use, but the CNT actually didn't. Instead, you have to get a significant majority vote in order to elect a new delegate. So it was kind of, it was kind of harder to, to, to do than it is in many kind of current anarchist organizations. And then there were other delegates for things like, you know, basically in charge of administration or, you know, writing letters and, and things like that. And, and they, none of these delegates were paid. And this was a deliberate choice because they didn't want to develop a paid bureaucracy. And then you have the next level up from the regional federations as you have, I'm trying, I can't remember how many layers there are, but there's, there are several layers until you get to the national federation, which is a, which holds regular congresses, although not as regular as they would like, because they were often illegal, so they couldn't hold the national congresses. So there are sometimes, you know, like really big gaps between the next national congress because they were yeah, in hiding from the police. And so at the national congresses, they're attended by delegates representing every single local union. So it's not just a meeting of all the representatives of, say, like the regional federation. It's a, every single local union is represented at the national congress and they all have one, uh, a vote. And then there is the national committee, which is elected by the congress who do essentially admin for the national trade union as a whole. And, that, and the only paid delegates in the entire organization in this period were, I think, two of the main people. One, the, the secretary of the national 
Federation and I think the secretary of the regional federation in Catalonia, which was the lar largest one in the country in Spain. So they only had, as far as I recall, two paid delegates. So there wasn't like a big bureaucracy. And one of the main ways they would make decisions were what were called plenums. So plenums are when you have a meeting of delegates, which aren't necessarily the same delegate as for the regional <laughs> Congress, but they would be elected specifically for the plenum, which would be a kind of short term, a bunch of different unions need to work on something. We're going to hold a plenum where we're going to discuss in an assembly composed of these delegates uh, what to do. And that, that was the main way decisions were made independently of the, the national congresses or the large regional congresses, which occurred at, you know, kind of certain regular intervals. The plenums were more like how a lot of the more day-to-day -day decisions were made between different parts of the CNT. So that, yeah, that that's roughly how it was organized. It's very complicated and quite hard to explain in words because it's easier when you kind of see a diagram. It, and, and that was massively prefigurative. But one of the things that happened is that when in the Spanish Revolution, the, the CNT although it's important to stress that a lot of the membership were against this decision or never agreed to it in the first place or ended up agreeing with it initially and then changed their mind. But what ends up happening is that they do join a coalition with the Republican government. And then you have some anarchist delegates who then end up becoming ministers in the government, which has never happened before. And what happened is that because of how states are organized, they often are only really able to effectively work with other centralized organizations. They coordinate with institutions that are, that are structured in a way that's very similar to them. And the CNT over time became more centralized during the Civil War and more bureaucratic as a direct result of the decision to participate in the existing state. So exactly what anarchist theory said would happen, happened. They were changed by that social relation independently of the intentions, and it became more centralized than it had been before. And this then had certain like negative effects. So there were like anarchists who were really critical of this decision. And you have people higher up in the kind of federation who are deliberately trying to ensure that their newspaper doesn't get sent paper with which to print on. So just as a way to like silence their critique, you know, you have things like this happen, which very much were not prefigurative. I wonder how much that was due to being maybe, you know, tied into the state, but how much of that is about executive action during war? Like, how do you tease them two things apart? Well, often, often there, there is a there is an extent to which you have kind of the what they were called the higher committees, where you know taking action and kind of regular plenums weren't being organised as much as they used to, although they were still being organised due to you know the situation. So that is a factor, but it's also the case that the CNT was able to maintain a really high level of kind of internal prefigurative organization during really extreme periods of state repression before. And for example, after the war, there were anarchists in concentration camps in France, that's because there were refugees from the war, who were able to, you know, organize the prefigurative federations within the prison camp itself. And this was a situation where people were dying of disease, there wasn't food, that there was like really dire circumstances they, they were in, but were still able to like organize in this way. So it's a thing where like, it's really difficult when you're looking at the sources to easily work out, you know, this was a response to this horrific war situation they were in. And that's why it became that way, just because people were trying to make decisions quickly versus this was like a product of their decision to, to join the state. It, it's a thing where like, you know, we, we can't run an experiment where we go, let's see what would happen if they made this different decision. And would this have, you know, would, would the increased centralization and bureaucratization still have occurred to the same extent? It's like there's this, you know, as always of history, there's a limit to what we can know. But there were a lot of people in the CNT who were convinced that one of the key reasons for the centralization and increasing bureaucratization was the decision to participate in the existing state. You know, this is because I'm trying to get towards like the kind of historical tendencies that have like, well, the historical examples of what happened to Marxist, inverted commas, parties and how they became complete bourgeois parties, in effect, in most countries. Like, same tendencies seem to exist to, not the same, similar tendencies seem to exist in the union form itself, that there are tendencies towards what we call them, guild unions or whatever in, in most bourgeois states, that it seems to be that 
there is similar tendencies at play in both. Like, for example, like one of these very, very difficult things would be for a CNT that is purely really sounds, you know, it was in a very pre prefigurative organization, which is like something we absolutely got to do in our future organizing. But it's like in, in, a, in a war example where the the time for the signal, the information to go from, say, more central nodes down to the decentral node to make the decisions up through the way on, say, tactical str strategic uh, maneuvers, like certain types, it seems like the actual prefiguration in the structure of the of the union negates the ability to take certain action certain types of actions you know like we were going to have a front that's going to go like i don't know towards C seville and as a fake as a head fake and then we've got another one in the item that's going to go towards barcelona like that e even even coming up with a strategy like that if everybody knows about it at a certain level it it makes it harder to even implement like it, it just seems that uh structurally the nature of war seems to like kind of make shit of prefiguration whether it's in a party or a or, so, or a union uh, the the army that lost the spanish civil war was a centralized army the militia the anarchist militias were incorporated into the normal army of the republican government and as a result a, a bunch of anarchists uh, left uh, and so, you know, centralized armies also lose to centralized armies, and that's basically every war. Second of all, Nestor uh, Makhno, the, the um, Ukrainian, Ukrainian anarchist, he, based on his experiences of combat in the in the Russian Revolution, where he was a he he was elected as a commander in in military situations, he argued that we should have some degree of centralization within the military, but that's it and nothing else. So he thinks the rest of the economy and day-to-day -day life should all be done through, you know, federations of general assemblies and delegates and so on. But he thinks within the military, you should have elected officers or elected by, by the troops who are accountable to the other structures in the society, you know, the community and workplace councils. But that in combat situations, you need to be able to have a, a uniform decision being implemented because if you don't if you have a situation where you know one group are going to do x and another group are going to do y then you don't have like a coherent strategy and and so he he did he did ad advocate that position it's also the case that in the anarchist militias in spain they would often talk about strategies and so on or outside of combat before going into it but within combat if one of their elected officers was like do this you know then they would and, and but outside of combat, the officer who was elected didn't have that power, so it was limited to these, you know, life or death situations. But I do think, you know, it's a it's a complex question how to structure militaries in a way that you will be able to effectively fight, a, you know, a war against a, a military whilst also not resolving the situation where you a, a new ruling class arises in the military and then can crush the other prefigurative organizations that are organized in a different way. And it's this thing where we don't really have lots of knowledge about how to do that, because in the Ukraine, for example, the you know Ukrainian army was defeated through a variety of reasons by the Bolshevik army, you know, like betrayal, surprise attacks. Literally not having ammunition was a key reason, because they weren't in a part of the country where all the ammunition was produced, while the Bolshevik army was. And so just, just due to lack of supplies made fighting much harder for them. Uh, and also they were a smaller military force and so on. But they were able to fight very effectively despite this and won several battles and played a key role in, in the uh, Russian uh, civil war. But they didn't exist, say, for like a decade, at which point you can really go, let's make a judgment on how effectively they were able to remain as prefigurative as possible while also being an effective combat force and also not negatively affecting the other independent prefigurative organizations. Like we don't, I don't think we have the data on it. But I do think you know, elected officers are a good idea. I do think it makes sense in life or death situations where like, okay, if, you, if this is what you said, you know, this is what my elected officer says, okay, we'll go along with that. Some anarchists really disagreed with this. Uh, some Russian anarchists were like, we should basically just have like guerrilla warfare by independent units forming agreements with one another and no like overarching command structure of elected officers. So there was disagreement, but I, you know, 
it's like, a complex I, topic and I, you know, I've never held a gun. So I, I always think it's weird for me to make any like prescriptions about this is what they should have done to win a war. More kind of like I can just report what they thought, what happened, and they were able to fight effectively in, in, in the Russian Revolution. And I don't think they lost because of uh, how they were organized. I think it was other factors like not having not having enough ammunition, being smaller. While in Spain, they were very quickly reabsorbed into the normal military, which then lost the war for, again, for lots of reasons to do with the fascist army was being supplied with top of the line weapons, tanks and aircraft by Mussolini and and, uh, Hitler's Nazi Germany. While the Republican government wasn't, they were having to buy really bad weapons on the black market that often didn't really work. They were using sometimes antiques that didn't work. The anarchists in particular often had the worst weaponry because a lot of the time the people in charge of distributing the weapons were either Republicans or Marxists of the Stalinist Stalinist. variety uh, who absolutely didn't want the anarchists to have good weapons uh, and went to great lengths to ensure that that that, that was the case. Yeah, history is complex. And it always annoys me when people kind of talk as if it's like really simple, like, if only they'd done, you know, this and it would have been fine. It's like, I'm kind of like, I don't know, but I can say what happened and what people yeah. thought. There, I, I personally feel there wasn't a, there wasn't a strategy for, for Spain. I just, I feel like it was a, a noble fight, but it just seemed like everything was against them. I, I don't know if anything, anything could have worked out any better. When you've got all the liberal nations not lifting a finger and you've got the fascist nations bombing your brains out, what are you going to do? Like you're up against way more mechanized and you know effective production systems. It just seems like there's just doomed. On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. (laughs) 